Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to this week's uh, webinar Wednesday presented by Syntec Instrumentation. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for being here and we hope uh, you'll continue to join us during these sessions. We're just going to wait another minute or so to give uh, a few more attendees time to uh, sign on. So uh, stay tuned and we'll be with you very shortly. Okay, so we're gonna get started here. Well, uh, once again, welcome everyone uh, to this week's uh, webinar Wednesday presented by Syntica Instrumentation. Uh, again, thank you for the, uh, joining us today and we hope that you'll continue to join us uh, during these sessions. Before we get started uh, with the presentation, we'd like to give you a quick introduction to, uh, of the physiology team. My name is Gus. I joined Syntica earlier this year, and my background is in pharmacology and toxicology. And my name is Sydney. I started with Syntica in 2019, and my background is in biology and medical science. And along with our colleague, Sarah McFarlane, the three of us handle the physiology product line here at Syntica, and uh, we'll be working as a team to deliver these webinar Wednesdays. So with that, let's dive into today's webinar. Today's topic is entitled, The Importance of Oxygenation in Tissue, an in vivo approach in animal models. And will be about tissue oxygenation, highlighting the fiber optic sensors used to study this important physiologic parameter. As we go through this presentation, if you have any questions, feel free to type them into the Q&A section at the bottom of your Zoom window. And at the end of the presentation, we'll try to answer as many as we can. And if we aren't able to get to your question while we're online, We'll send you a reply via email after the webinar. Uh, we're hoping that these webinars will be a bit less formal than some of the uh, others you may have attended. What we really want to accomplish is, uh, is that this hour is more collaborative and interactive for you guys to be able to get to know the products and the techniques behind what we do. Uh, to get things started, uh, let's run a quick poll uh, regarding what, if any, technology you currently use to measure tissue oxygenation in your research. Uh, the options are pulse oximetry, uh, electrode sensor, fiber optic sensor, other, or none. Let me bring up a poll here. So if you currently use uh, a method to measure uh, tissue oxygenation, uh, feel free to uh, pick one of the options there, uh, or if you don't, uh, let us know that, uh, that as well. It looks like we have uh, almost everyone here. I'll just give another few seconds. Yeah, I think. Uh, Pretty much done there. Thank you very much uh, for uh, your feedback. Bring a poll here. Yeah, sorry about that. 
Uh, before we begin, uh, let's take a look at what we'll be talking about today. Uh, to start, we will review tissue oxygenation and its importance and what it provides us with. Then we'll review four ways that researchers uh, measure uh, in, in vivo tissue oxygen and compare them. And from there, we'll provide an introduction into the Oxylite system by Oxford Optronics, a tissue vitality monitor utilizing phosphorescence quenching technology. And then we'll finish off with some example uh, PO2 data. Okay, so why is it important to measure dissolved oxygen in tissues? Well, it's widely known that the survival of tissues and organs relies on an adequate supply of oxygen. The measurement of tissue oxygen tension, or PTIO2, provides a direct measurement of the balance between oxygen supply delivered by the blood and metabolic oxygen consumption uh, by the tissue. In other words, a readout of oxygen availability at the cellular level. Research continues to show heterogeneous changes in perfusion of organs leads to areas of hypoxia and organ dysfunction. Monitoring these changes is essential in order to determine the pathological mechanisms leading to tissue hypoxia and the subsequent development of potential therapies. One challenge, and we'll touch upon this a little bit later, is performing long-term measurements of tissue oxygenation chronically throughout disease progression. There are options for making these measurements in long-term chronic models. And like I said, we'll uh, be looking at this later on. To measure dissolved tissue oxygen, there are a number of tech technologies available. So let's have a look. There are several ways researchers can measure oxygenation of tissue in vivo. We will discuss the following four techniques. There's the Clark type oxygen electrode, carbon paste electrodes, injectable dye phosphorescent sensors, and fiber optic phosphorescent sensors. We will briefly explain each one. In the following slides, compare and contrast the specifications and characteristics of these various sensors. So Clark type oxygen electrode sensors are electrochemical sensing instruments where the chemical element of interest, in our case oxygen, passes through a Teflon membrane and chemically interacts with the electrolyte and platinum cathode in the sensor to produce electrons, or in other words, a current. The current strength is proportional to oxygen in the tissue. These sensors determine the partial pressure of oxygen, but not the absolute concentration. Carbon paste electrodes work similarly to the Clark by creating an electrical current, but these sensors use a, graph a graphite, excuse me, silicone paste mixture that interacts directly with the tissue of interest to generate the current. Compared to the Clark type electrodes, CPEs are less sensitive to temperature at the measurement site. With phosphorescence sensors, oxygen efficiently quenches the fluorescence and phosphorescence of certain luminophores, a process also known as dynamic fluorescence quenching. This quenching process is established upon the principle that the presence of molecular dissolved oxygen in tissues or fluids can terminate or quench light emitted by a fluorescent compound dye. The extent of the quenching of the fluorescent light is directly proportional to the partial pressure of oxygen in the vicinity of the dye. This forms the basis of the mechanism of phosphorescent sensors. We will now compare the specifications and characteristics of electrode sensors, injectable dye phosphorescent sensors, and fiber optic phosphorescent sensors. First, the mechanisms between these sensors. As previously mentioned, electrode sensors generate a current proportional to the reduction of oxygen, whereas phosphorescent sensors utilize phosphorescence quenching technology, in other words, the rate of collisions between the, the fluorescent dye and oxygen molecules. Moving on to the site of measurement, electrode sensors must be in contact with the interstitial volume. Injectable dye probes also must be in contact with the tissue. However, a dye must be injected into the circulatory system or directly into the tissue to perform these measurements. If the site of interest is too deep for the laser to reach, the dye will not fluoresce and oxygen measurement cannot occur. Similar to electrode sensors, Fiber optic sensor tips must also be in direct contact with the interstitial volume. These sensors are able to reach deep tissue sites with soluble dye methods 
can struggle to reach. With respect to uh, spatial resolution, electrode sensors can measure a wide variety of area sizes, as small as three microns up to 100 millimeters. And depending on what you're interested in measuring, sensor size varies. The injectable dye probes will measure whatever microliter of dye is injected and to the extent of its dispersion in the tissue. Fiber optic phosphorescent sensors are mainly invasive for in vivo applications measuring areas from 200 microns up to 8 millimeters square. The oxylate oxygen sensors that we will be discussing shortly range in diameter from about 230 microns up to 750 microns and suit a host of tissue monitoring applications where measurement sites vary in size. So now let's uh, review some of the advantages of these various uh, sensor types. Uh, electrode sensors provide unambiguous measurements of PO2 under most conditions. They're also telemetry compatible, allowing the measurement of PO2 longitudinally. One example here is Kaha telemetry, also offered by Syntica, uh, and they have an implantable carbon paste electrode for tissue oxygen measurement in conscious, freely moving rats. The injectable dye phosphorescent sensors offer an advantage for measuring either locally in small vessels or within large tissue areas. It can also be, uh, these measurements can also be non-invasive through IV injection of the dye. And lastly, the fiber optic phosphorescent sensors are small with a fast response time, beneficial for monitoring rapid and acute physiologic changes. Because they do not consume oxygen during the measurement, they allow for the best sensitivity at physiologic and hypoxic conditions. These sensors do not require recalibration as they come factory calibrated, and saving researchers time in ensuring measurements are comparable between the subjects. The last comparison we'll, uh, we'll review between these technologies are their respective limitations. Electrode sensors uh, can cause acute tissue jam damage because they have to be inserted in the tissue, and they do consume oxygen while measuring. Uh, and they are subject to calibration drift and generally tend to have slower frequency response times. Injectable dye phosphorescent probes have poor depth penetration for deep tissue measurements because of, as I said earlier, the laser cannot reach the site of interest. The dye uh, cannot fluoresce and oxygen measurement uh, cannot take place. To combat this, however, there are near infrared dyes that uh, can be used as they measure deeper. However, with these, you do compromise on spatial resolution. Fiber optic phosphorus sensors, similar to electrode sensors, can cause acute tissue damage, again, because they have to be directly uh, inserted in the tissue. Uh, and the dye it does become photo bleached after a long uh, term monitoring. Uh, and an active laser source and detector is required uh, in order to make the measurements, and these are not uh, compatible for telemetry type uh, experiments. So in summary, each method does offer its own pros and cons, depending upon the application. So when choosing a method, you must consider the implications of each technology for your application and ensure that the data you wish to collect can accurately be obtained with the method you choose. For the rest of the presentation, uh, we'll focus on the fiber optic sensor technology measurement uh, for tissue PO2. The advantage of the advantage that fiber optic sensors offer over electrode sensors is that this chemical process of phosphorescence question does not consume oxygen. So in hypoxic environments, when oxygen consumption needs to be precisely measured, these sensors can do so with minimal error or compensation calculations. Additionally, they offer high fidelity monitoring of rapid and acute PO2 changes with a temporal resolution as low as half a second. Uh, applied treatments during procedures like IV drug injections or what have you can be monitored precisely and at a speed relevant to rapid physiologic responses. 
Uh, thus, it is a user-friendly option that is appropriate for the widest variety of tissue oxygenation studies, particularly for research, researchers with several research goals and tissues of interest. So with that, uh, my colleague Sydney here uh, will review the world's most user-friendly dissolved oxygen monitor for in vivo and in vitro PO2 measurements. Thank you, Gus. In 1998, Oxford Optronics pioneered the commercialization of fiber optic oxygen microsensor technology. The fluorescence-based technique employed by the Oxylite monitors provide integrated temperature compensation and absolute measurements of dissolved oxygen displayed in absolute units of millimeters of mercury. Today, there are over 500 peer-reviewed journal citations of the Oxylite brand. There are three models to choose from, dependent upon your research objectives, a single channel system and two different multi-channel systems. These are dissolved oxygen and temperature monitors that are fully plug and play with no sensor calibration procedures required. Available for both in vivo and in vitro applications, you can choose between one channel, two channel or four channel configurations. Measured PO2 is dependent on the local temperature at the sensing tip. In general, it is therefore important that there is temperature compensation for PO2 measurements. To this end, the Oxylite monitors incorporate a calibrated temperature measurement system. The one channel Oxylite can support one oxygen or one combined oxygen temperature sensor. The Oxylite Pro is a dual channel monitor capable of supporting up to two oxygen or combined oxygen temperature sensors simultaneously, while the Oxylite Pro XL monitor in the image on the right is a four channel monitor capable of supporting up to four oxygen or combined oxygen temperature sensors simultaneously. This monitor has two doors on either side of the touchscreen where two sensors can be plugged in on the left and two sensors on the right. What we're seeing on the monitor is that channel one and channel two are collecting PO2 measurements while channel three and channel four are not connected to any sensor. The top graph is displaying channel 1 measuring 158 millimeters of mercury at a temperature of 21.1 degrees Celsius, and channel 2 is measuring 163 millimeters of mercury also at 21.1 degrees. The dip in the graph shows an example of what happens to the trace on the screen with a drop in measured oxygen, and we can see that the measurement eventually returns to baseline. The multi-channel productivity suits all needs, including the simultaneous monitoring of oxygen from multiple tissue sites, for example, comparison of pathological versus controlled tissue sites, or multiple in vitro samples. These multi-channel systems also include enhanced features such as an intuitive touchscreen for control and viewing. The state-of-the-art optoelectronics of the Oxylite system offers superior signal stability and accuracy in the physiological range. Even under extreme hypoxic conditions, the Oxylite is sensitive enough to deliver accurate results. And remember, because fiber optic phosphorescent probes do not consume oxygen, something especially important for hypoxia models, you can be sure that you are measuring true PO2. And finally, the Oxylite integrates easily with any third-party data acquisition system for displaying and analyzing waveforms for hassle-free data collection and analysis. It even has an option for direct USB connection capabilities for use with LabChart Pro by AD Instruments. We can quickly review the Oxylite oxygen monitor with another technology, pulse oximetry. Pulse oximetry provides blood oxygen saturation, or percentage of hemoglobin saturated by oxygen, of the whole body, showing only hemoglobin status of the whole animal. In contrast, the oxylite, which utilizes that phosphorescence quenching technology, provides a direct readout of oxygen availability to cells and tissues. The oxylite takes the measurements from the sensors located at the site of measurement and are recorded as absolute units of millimeters of mercury or kilopascals, while pulse oximetry tends to use one sensor for a whole body measure, 
and our relative units, measured as percent hemoglobin bound with oxygen. Let's take a look at some of the oxalite sensors. Oxford Optronics offers a wide range of oxygen sensors to meet requirements of various experimental models. Each sensor does not alter oxygen content in the tissue when measuring, and each sensor also has the option of integrating temperature sensing for auto compensation of the PO2 measurement. All sensors come pre-calibrated, and that calibration is guaranteed for two years, so truly a plug-and-play system. Longevity of the sensor depends on the operating sampling rate. The oxygen sensors are consumable as the dye eventually gets photobleached with use. Depending on the anticipated change in tissue PO2, the user can easily select from a list of sampling rate presets through the touchscreen interface on the Pro and Pro XL models. Example of the sampling rates and corresponding sensor longevity can be seen in the table on the right hand of the side of the screen. So how exactly do the oxylite systems work? Well, the oxylite is an optical device based upon the principle that the presence of molecular dissolved oxygen in tissues or fluids can terminate or quench light emitted by a fluorescent compound, a dye. The quenching of the fluorescent light is proportional to the PO2 in the vicinity of the dye. When that dye is illuminated or excited with light from the monitor, it fluoresces. The fluorescent light is then returned to the monitor using the same optical fiber, and the signal processor determines the fluorescent decay time. From this, the corresponding PO2 is derived. And as PO2 in the vicinity of the sensing tip decreases, extent of the quenching decreases and fluorescence decay time increases. The oxylite monitors perform automatic temperature compensation and generate a continuous readout of temperature when combined oxygen temperature sensors are in use. Our next couple of slides will briefly, briefly review the various sensors available. As I just mentioned, sensors are available featuring integrated thermocouples to support the automatic temperature compensation of oxygen readings. All sensors are suitable for virtually any tissue type and for in vitro dissolved oxygen measurements. The bare fiber sensors have a polymer layer that encapsulates the tip and the fiber, giving an overall tip diameter of approximately 250 microns. The oxygen-only sensor is also available in an 8-meter length, providing support and compa compatibility for MRI applications. Needle-type sensors are, while being encased in surgical steel, to offer greater robustness and tissue placement can be done directly. Oxygen detection is via lateral windows, distal from the sensor tip. The large area type sensors are also encased in a surgical steel cage, and oxygen detection is via lateral windows, distal from sensor tip. The difference in these sensors is that they do not have that needle tip and offer a larger sampling area and volume of either one millimeter squared or eight millimeter squared. At the beginning of the presentation, Gus mentioned one challenge is performing long-term measurements of tissue oxygenation chronically throughout disease progression. And to overcome this, Oxford Optronics created implantable sensors. The Oxylite chronic implantable sensors allow for longitudinal tissue vitality studies. The sensors are connected to the Oxylite system via a detachable tether. In other words, the tether only needs to be attached when recording data. Options are bare fiber sensors or large area sensors, and all of which employ similar characteristics to the previously discussed sensors. However, these all require manual temperature compensation. Additionally, all of the chronic implantable type sensors have a 10 millimeter bead left outside the body and are intended for single use only. You can see um, a comparison image on the right compared with a dime to understand the sizing of these sensors. Now with that, let's review some applications for the Oxylite system. The number of research models and applications is quite broad. 
The more common and well-established models include cancer research, specifically with investigations revolving around tumor hypoxia as it relates to cellular therapies. Also common is cerebral monitoring for stroke and MCAO models to quantify cerebral ischemia and reperfusion injury. We will be highlighting an example of a cerebral ischemia model later on in this presentation. Some other models include hemorrhagic shock and transplantation research across all vital organ systems, wound healing, and ophthalmology research. Finally, in vitro models are also a popular application for the oxalate system, including cell culture hypoxia, bioreactors, and tissue engineering. You'll find on our website a full list of publications citing the oxalate system, but I will be introducing a couple of data examples on the next two slides. The first example here involves an oxygen and temperature sensor to measure in real time PO2 in a flank tumor in a chronic conscious nude mouse model. The intervention involved the use for photodynamic therapy or PDT. In red and along the left y-axis is the PO2 measurements. In blue and along the right y-axis is the temperature and the x-axis represents time in minutes. PO2 was measured during short periods of PDT laser inactivity by synchronizing the laser and probe connection status, represented by yellow squares as the time the laser was on and the probe was off, while the yellow lines between the squares are when the laser was off and the probe on. As you can see, when the PDT laser was activated, it resulted in a decrease in tumor PO2 with a simultaneous increase in temperature caused by the laser heating the tumor. Upon cessation of the PDT treatment, both PO2 and temperature can be seen returning to pretreatment levels. We also see here the close relationship between tissue temperature and the PO2 measurement, reinforcing the importance of the temperature compensating feature of the oxalite system. Another example here shows oxygen shown in red at the top, temperature shown in blue in the middle, and blood flow data shown in black at the bottom from a cerebral ischemia model, which time in minutes is along the x-axis again. This experiment involved a carotid artery occlusion in an, in an anesthetized rodent with data collected from a single multi-parameter sensor inserted via a craniotomy. Oxford Optronics offers these versatile sensors for complete tissue vitality recordings, and I'll briefly introduce this on the next slide. As you can see, when the carotid artery was occluded, there was an immediate drop in cerebral PO2, blood flow, and temperature. Upon release of that occlusion, there was a substantial transient increase in all three of these parameters. This is of particular importance for studying reperfusion injury and to investigate effects of neuroprotective drugs. So how can all three measurements be acquired from a single sensor? The triple parameter sensors incorporate laser Doppler flow technology along with the PO2 and temperature sensing technologies. The sensors connect to both the OxyFlow, a laser Doppler tissue blood perfusion monitor, and Oxylite systems for an ergonomic combined configuration. The laser Doppler flow sensors, shown as a schematic in the middle image, have two fiber optic probes. The one transmitting probe sends low power laser light to illuminate the tissue of interest, whereby that light is scattered by moving blood cells, resulting in a Doppler shift compared to the non-moving static tissue of the reflected light, which is then detected by the second receiving probe. The extent of that Doppler shift is proportional to the flow rate of the red blood cells in the tissue. These laser Doppler flow measurements are ideal for microvascular tissue studies. We will be presenting a future webinar on the combined oxylide and oxyflow systems and benefits of measuring tissue oxygen, temperature, and blood flow simultaneously. Let us know in the chat if you would be interested in attending that webinar, and we'll be sure to get you the registration link. And with that, thank you so much for joining us today to learn about tissue oxygenation, its importance, the technology options 
available for measuring dissolved oxygen in tissues, both in vivo and in vitro, and the various applications that can be studied using the Oxylite monitors by Oxford Optronics. We hope you enjoyed this webinar Wednesday and that you'll tune in for more. Syntica will be announcing future session topics very soon, and Gus and I will now go through some questions that were submitted during the presentation and begin a discussion. Feel free to continue to submit questions as we um, begin this Q&A session. And I will also send a link in the chat to our webinar page if you would like to check out some of the upcoming webinars that we have lined up. Yeah. So we'll get started with the first question here. Um, we have a question, how big are the fiber optic sensors for the Oxylite? Um, so all of the sensors offered range in sizes. And actually, we have great resources available on our website on the page. There are actually videos that cover specific information um, about each of the probes and which ones are used um, for which applications. Uh, another question here says, uh, can these be sensor, can these sensors be used in the brain? And uh, yes, um, we have many uh, uh, customer researchers that uh, use the system for, for stroke and brain ischemia research, as we had indicated in one of the slides, uh, especially combined uh, with the OxyFlow. Uh, another question here is, uh, when you say slower response times, what is the scale? What is the frequency response um, or, uh, for the electrode and fiber optic uh, sensors? So, there, so, the, um, so for the fiber optic, a, uh, uh, and the answer is usually about uh, less than a 20 second for a standard oxygen sensor and less than two seconds for temperature measurements. And that's, again, for the oxalate uh, fiber optic. Um, for the electrode, um, I'm not exactly sure. Yeah. Um, are, we can um, send you that information absolutely. as well from the table. Um, it did have some example of frequency response times there. Uh, another question here is, are there problems with clot formation at the tip of the sensor? Uh, generally for uh, acute studies, uh, it, it's not too much of a concern because the, um, uh, the sensor tip isn't uh, in contact very long. Uh, I'm not familiar of any uh, uh, feedback we've gotten from various customer applications about uh, uh, clotting, but I can definitely uh, dig deeper into that uh, and, uh, and get an answer for you. We have a next question. Can these be inserted into arteries of large animals? Um, I think we'll let our colleague Sarah join in with this one and give her experience and advice. Yeah, for sure. Um, so it depends on um, which artery you are interested in, but um, the smallest sensor that we carry is about 300 microns in diameter. So they can absolutely be used inside an artery of a large animal. However, you do have to heparinize the sensor when you are putting it directly into blood. Um, so that you don't form a clot around the tip because mm -hmm. that will definitely um, affect the ability for the sensor to read properly. Um, as for the clot formation, um, like I just said, in blood that definitely becomes um, a concern and so we do suggest heparinizing the sensor. But for tissue, especially um, highly vascularized tissues like the brain, uh, you tend not to have an issue because they are quite small. Um, and if you introduce the sensor properly, um, as suggested with um, a very sharp needle, um, the damage tends to be quite minimal. And so um, there doesn't, 
usually tend to be a lot of bleeding around the sensor unless you nick um, a major artery. Uh, we do have some studies that have shown um, histology of sensor implantation sites in different locations um, in different animal models and there's usually very little um, immune response and clotting and scar formation around the sensor. So hopefully okay. that answered your question. Sir, we have another question here about uh, whether these sensors can be uh, inserted into a fetal animal. Uh, are there any uh, uh, papers out there or any published uh, studies uh, citing the use of uh, these sensors in a fetal model? Uh, I'm not sure of any off the top of my head. We can definitely take a look in our resource um, files, but theoretically these sensors can be placed anywhere. So if you're willing to surgically open, um, you can place the sensor into any tissue of interest. Um, so a fetal animal would be an option for sure. Um, that being said, they are invasive sensors. So if it's a long, like a longitudinal study, um, you wanna be careful about where the sensor is being placed um, and for how long. Um, so application specific questions, if you want, you can send us an email um, or reach out to us on our website. Um, the link's at the bottom of your page there. And um, we can absolutely answer those application specific questions um, more personally for you. Yeah, thanks so much, Sarah. We have another great question. Um, have any of these sensors been implanted chronically for long-term preparations? Um, the answer is yes. There is some great, um, we have a great paper actually on this um, with sensors implanted in, I believe Sarah, if you can clarify it's in sheep. Yeah, yeah, adult sheep kidney. Yeah, so we can send that to you if you're interested. Um, it's a really interesting study there. Uh, just a, a minor uh, or smaller technical question here about uh, uh, how they are sterilized. Um, as with most uh, uh, sensitive electrodes, uh, they cannot be autoclaved because uh, the high temperature and, and, and that can damage them. So generally uh, room temperature uh, methods such as uh, ethylene oxide or, uh, or a sterad solution is what's used to uh, sterilize uh, these probes. And we have one more here. Would they be appropriate for P2 mice? Um, I can take this one. Um, sure. So a P2 mouse is a stage of mouse pup. Um, they tend to have slightly different anatomy, especially regarding um, the nervous system. So you can, like I said earlier, you can theoretically use these sensors in any tissue. So you could put it into a P2 mouse for sure. Um, it depends on how long you wanna leave it in for and the insertion technique that you plan to use and the tissue of interest that would really more determine whether or not they were appropriate for what you were interested in. Um, but yeah, we can absolutely send you more information on that if you wanna send us an email. Um, the email at the bottom of the screen, sales at syntica.com. And you can type your question there and um, that will be forwarded along to us so that we can respond um, and maybe have like a nice uh, web, or um, sorry, uh, an online meeting, like a Zoom meeting or something um, that we can chat a little bit further about your application. Yeah, that's great. Um, and we have one more question. Can these sensors be used in the brain? The answer is- I covered that already. Oh, okay. I, I took that one Sorry about that. <laughs> All right. Um, so we just sent along that link that I had mentioned earlier um, with all of our upcoming webinars. We do try and update as often as possible as new webinars come out. Um, so feel free to take a look there as well. Um, and if, is there any more questions? No. Doesn't Great. Look like it. So on behalf of uh, Sydney and uh, Sarah and the rest of the syndicate team, uh, we'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you uh, at future uh, Webinar Wednesday events. Uh, and until then, uh, be safe, uh, take care, and uh, have a good day.